All right, let me know. Let me know if it goes uh, okay. in and out. <clears throat> sorry, I, I interrupted no, you. I no, 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 no. I mean, we don't want. Uh, what do you mean, sorry? No, uh, you shouldn't interrupted me, and you should have yes. unusable fucking audio. <laughs> You're right. We talked about that. Remember, that was like the first thing we talked yeah, about. So what are you talking about? Oh yeah, we, we talked for two hours. It's inaudible though. Thanks anyway. So I don't want to be rude. <laughs> what um? Where were? Oh you. Oh, let's just go back. I'll say what your Patreon is. That's where it was. Today is Friday, October 26, 2018, and this is Daily DVR. Welcome back, everyone, to a Friday show. I've got a great guest today. I'm going to introduce him right off the top before I even pimp myself. I'm going to pimp him. His name is Justin Thomas. What's up, Justin? Uh, Not much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for pimping me, by the way. It means a lot, sir. And happy to be here for a Daily DVR. Yeah, it's going to be fun. So... I'm going to go over um, a couple of news items. Justin and I will talk about them. I'm going to do a little bit of what's streaming new today. And then we're going to get into a deeper discussion about sitcoms and stuff. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I do, of course, want to start out by reminding you, you can check us out at dvrpodcast.com. You can also go to patreon.com slash dvr and become a patron. Get the show five days a week. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday is for all. Tuesday and Thursday is for the patrons. So go to Patreon. Justin, what's your Patreon again? It is Justin Thomas Show at Patreon.com. And I have uh, also, I'm going to say adapted, but let's be real. I stole uh, your your format. <laughs> and I am doing a slightly less ambitious three podcasts. Nice. I like it. I dig it. I'm doing that. It's I'm your down. idea, so I would hope. Let's do it. I think it'll be fun. Um, and also... So you check this out on Patreon, and then you wanted to ask a question. So you can email at dvrpodcast at gmail.com. All right, so let's get back to the show. Jump in. A little feedback. I did get a great email. Actually, it was a Twitter DM. She slid into my DMs, newbie doos, and she talked about Man in the High Castle Season 2. I also got an email from Jenny talking a little Mayans and some other stuff. I'm going to save both of those emails for Monday. And we're going to jump right into the news. All right. You ready for the news, Justin? Uh, Yes. Yes, I am. All right. Okay. So the first thing we got today, and this came a little bit late, and actually I didn't email this to you, Justin, so I'll get your live reaction. I think you probably heard about this already. It is official. The Boba Fett spinoff A Star Wars Story movie is totally dead. Kathleen Kennedy confirmed it to um, serious XM journalist Eric Weber that the movie is dead and they are rolling any of the stuff that they were working on with that into the Mandalorian TV series from Jon Favreau that's going to be on the Disney streaming service. I think this is very good news. I'm all about them going forward. I don't need any more backstory on Star Wars. Honestly, I don't care. Solo was a lot of fun. I'm going to do a review of it coming up soon. I enjoyed it, but it didn't forward the story. It's not like the Marvel movies where you pick up a little thing and it's in another movie and it just, it's not working like that. So how do you feel about this, Justin? I am always happy when new stories are being told. So as what, most likely was the issue. I did not watch the solo movie. I know a lot of people did not like it. I just heard you did. But the issue with movies like that, nobody needs to go find out how he got his blaster. I guess somebody gave it to him or how he met Chewie. You know, I mean, I guess that sounds interesting, but it's it's about leaving some stuff to the imagination, telling some new stories. I don't know how Fabrell feels about it being rolled into his story and how that's going to work out. Hopefully that's not going to impede on his creative process. But yeah, I mean, we talked about this the last time I was on. I'm not a huge Star Wars fan, but I do respect it and I enjoy it. And I think that all of the smaller projects always turn out better because there's less interference and they let them do what they're going to do. They're not trying to recreate the original trilogy. So yeah, I think that's good news. They're, they're you know, they're smartening up, hopefully. Yeah, I agree. I think it it is a good sign. And I like the way that they are reacting to what's happening and rolling with it. And Oh, okay. Okay. So I think that this 
Yes. <laughs> okay. I'll jump back in. So I think this is great news. I think it shows that they're quickly reacting to what fans and what the market and what basically what works and what doesn't. And you have to do that. You might try to roll out this big plan, but guess what? They could be embarrassed by it and then keep on trying to do it. Like it seems kind of as what DC kept on doing. Like we're just going to push ahead, which has not worked out. And I have zero interest in Aquaman or really any of that stuff. And uh, this is the opposite. Now, as far as this stuff being rolled into it, I think it's more from an aspect of money and um, commitment to people, things like that, than it, marketing, than it is story. So it doesn't seem like they're going to mess with them. They're just kind of going to push that instead of pushing these big things. And I hope it means that if they're going to do these prequel type things, do it on the streaming service. Okay. So if you want to do like an eight episode Obi-Wan, okay, that's great. Do it. That's fun. But I don't need a movie and seven or eight months of trailers and build up. And it's just, it's, uh, I find it to be unnecessary. So now do you think I have to ask this, if it was also a financial disaster as well as the critical disaster that it was, do you think they'd be making these changes? Um, I think they would take the critical fail. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think that they probably would, because that is not what drives their bottom line. And honestly, I'm not so against that. You know, I don't. I think I, I'm. I mean, I love critics, and I'm. And I'm. I take what people say and people who I trust, and I got. I mean, people are listening to us now. I take it seriously, and I take it into account, but. Honestly, for me, it's more kind of word of mouth, you know, from many people, you kind of get a feeling for something. And I think that they got the right feeling for this and they did the right thing. So hopefully they did. I don't always agree with uh, reacting so quickly to fans because we always don't know what's right for us. And I've said that before, and that's all I'll say. But I do believe that if this was not such a financial disaster, that they would have kept pushing their agenda. So I guess, thank God it was both. And you're right. You know, I mean. I don't know. I mean, Solo all around made a lot of people angry and it's hard for people not to love Star Wars movies. But The Last Jedi has shown that there's, you know, a split in the fandom. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I am lucky that I am just I just enjoy Star Wars. I'm not if I was as passionate about Star Wars as I was about Westworld or Game of Thrones, I'd probably be a a little bit of a mess. Yeah, I don't. I'm always a safe distance with, with all my fandoms, even if I take it seriously to myself personally, uh, uh, I don't let whatever's happening really affect me because it's a personal thing. But now coming to something that was very personal that happened today, and this this is another thing I kind of add, and I think you saw this email, which was that film struck the kind of criterion collection, I guess you would call it like more curated art film films, more quality films in in respect, not only to the selection they have, but like Turner Classic, they try to show the correct print aspect ratio of a film. Uh, Filmstruck has been shut down by Warner Media. It's going, it's just going to stop working, I guess, at the end of October. Oh, no, I'm sorry. At the end of November, November 29th. And of course, I follow a lot of film critics and I am a film person myself. I don't have film struck because I only have a certain amount of services and things I can pay for. But I appreciate Criterion. You know, when I used to work back at World of Video, we had every single Criterion people would come to get them. And we had ones that went out of print, like they're the first ones and all these weird things. And it's fantastic. And I'm a huge TCM fan. And I think that this is pretty sucky because the way that Filmstruck ran their service, the curation behind it was an important part of it. I don't think that all these films are going to disappear, right? Warner is going to probably under AT&T, AT&T is probably just going to turn this into the other streaming service and these movies will pop up somewhere else. But you lose that kind of, you know, that that filmic quality, that classic, you know, people care are curating this whole service. 
So it's kind of sad that this happened, but you know, I mean, there's too many streaming services as there is. Yeah, you, you know, you how many do it. you subscribe? To? Uh, three. And you just said it. I mean, look at how passionate you are about it and you're not paying for it. So, and I'm not trying to talk exactly. on you, but it's, yep. it's, it, that's a hard truth. You know, it is a business. I mean, I, I have three, I have Hulu, I have Netflix and I have Amazon. So it is yep. what it, it is. is. I, I'll I probably spring for the Disney. Yeah, me too. Because Disney owns everything. And I just hope that once I buy that membership, they just become the <laughs> monopoly. They're trying to act like they're not. And it just turns into, I own everything. So, yeah. well, that's what I think is happening here too, which is that you're having a explosion. It's like, you know, the big bang and then the big contraction. Everybody launches a streaming service and then they're all going to kind of get sucked in again. And actually, this is really like the second or third wave of that. Because if you remember when Netflix originally launched, it all, you saw all these crackle and this and that. And well, some of them are still around. Some of them have been bought. And now we're kind of like into the second wave. And I think we're getting closer to what you're talking about, where there will only be two or three of these. And within that, you may be able to subscribe. Like Filmstruck may be reborn inside of AT&T's new streaming service as a separate channel that you pay for. Yeah, you know, they just want to get you into their walled garden so they can control what you're doing, just like Apple giving, going a global launch with its streaming service and allowing all these other little services to be on it, but their stuff is for free on top of it, you know? Yeah, so they're, they're always very giving at Apple, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. My Apple charger doesn't work for my Apple product. It's, it's not yeah. compatible. It's like you got to pay more. Uh, yeah. I mean, Crackle is still around from what I know, and I think that's only due to the anime and magna you know mm -hmm. um community which i'm not a part of but i respect and i think that keeps that alive but we see definitely what you're saying has some truth to it because look what just got canceled luke cage and iron fist yep. from, from netflix we're seeing the consolidation yep. because when disney launches i can't imagine that those marvel products um uh, are going to stay over there that just doesn't seem like that could happen and it's a shame for daredevil and jessica jones besides that it is what it is. Yeah, but they, they'll be, I don't know. I'm not even sure that Netflix owns those in, per, in perpetuity. So I know that the guys behind Luke Cage have already said, you know, I'm, we're moving on to other things. But everybody says that until Disney comes and gives you a check for a bazillion dollars and you go, guess what? I'm Luke Cage. I'm back on, on Instagram. And everyone's like, you're awesome. We love you. Yeah. All your fist just said, we're sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For, for being a show. Okay. We're sorry about that. But uh, okay, another getting to, this is not streaming, but this is HBO, another piece of news. Um, I thought this was pretty interesting that Emma Thompson is going to start an HBO BBC limited series, another co-production. Th those are also huge. It's written by Russell Davies from Doctor Who, and it's pretty interesting. So the six episode series called, uh, wait, what's it going to be called? Years and Years begins in 2000. 2019 with Britain rocked by unstable political, economic, and technological changes. Gosh, I couldn't think of if that's... that's yeah, it's a little far-fetched. <laughs> hmm. Gosh, I can't think of another country that happened to. It will follow members of the Lions family as their lives converge on one night and then over the next 15 years as the twists and turns of everyday life are explored and viewers find out what, if any, effect the clan had on the world, blah, blah, blah. But I thought that was interesting and you, I know you're so interested in technique writing structure mm -hmm. that I, when I saw this, I thought it'd be cool to talk about it because I find that to be fascinating. I mean, first Emma Thompson's great. I like Russell T Davis and I, he just did a very English scandal, which I thought was fantastic. I love that. I don't know if you caught that, but that was fantastic. Um, this looks to be really cool. And I love this idea of following because we're all in this now and everybody's saying like, what's America going to be like in 10 years? What's this? So I think it's kind of cool to put it in the UK and then kind of follow a family through all of this crazy stuff that's like going guinea on. guinea pigs. Like Let them see it. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I agree. And I do find this fascinating. Uh, right away when I read this, when you sent it to me, I just thought of, oh my God, how frustrating that would be to format. I'm very interested in how also rewarding it would be to to pull it off. Because what you said, it's six episodes, right? Yeah. 
and it's going to span 15 years. Yeah, that's wow. good, right? Well, that is good. And they said they only needed six episodes. Yeah, I like that. I like the less episodes. I like it too. I like it. And I think it's interesting too, because when you look at uh, politics, um, and I try not to because of how depressing it is, but when you look at, you know, uh, whatever, uh, presidents, when you look at prime ministers, when you look at any head of state, any type of legislature that goes through it, you, you don't really know the effects until years and years and years, you know, after. So it's not right away that you're going to see the effects of Obama or Trump. Trump, sometimes it's right away. happens. so I think it's really smart. It's realistic. And I mean, yeah, there's a lot of turmoil going on over there. You know, Brexit was a mess and it's things are a changing. So I think I think it's really great that these uh, really high concept ideas are coming for these miniseries over on HBO. We saw Amy Adams recently. And what was that? Uh, Sharp. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of the cool thing to do right now, but it is a cool thing. I like it and it's quality. So, yeah, you're getting big names to jump over and do these little series, you know. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting. And I like BBC One as well. They, they do a lot of good work. So that collaboration is solid. Yeah, I'm very excited about it. I do. I agree that, that what you were saying, too. I like that HBO is you know, everybody's looking for the next Game of Thrones. They have Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones is going away. So they're coming out with a new Game of Thrones. And then they're not, they have Westworld. I think Westworld is doing, I mean, that we'll have to do a podcast about what you thought of Westworld season. (laughs) Yeah, it was different. Yeah, we'll get into that. But it is pretty popular. And I like these little series. I like the limited series idea. So this is pretty cool. Six episodes, but it spans so long. It's creative. It's good people. I'm down with it. All right. So let's. It's not the same story time and time again. Like this is six episodes. This is going to be great. It's not. Oh my god, we had a success. Can we milk this thing until it has no integrity left? Well, they could go for another six and then go until they're, you know, sixty. But at least it's going to move. You know what I mean? It won't be like boring. No. So fifteen years and six episodes. I'm interested. Now, speaking of not boring, this was very exciting to me, and this dropped yesterday. One of my favorite directors, Richard Linkletter, is planning a Bill Hicks biopic. They haven't said who's going to play Bill Hicks. I don't think it really matters, but I am a huge Bill Hicks fan. My brother inter- my brother's four years older than me. He introduced me to Bill Hicks when I was, I think, gosh, in maybe in high school or a little bit later in college. And I am a huge fan. And I just think there's so many great stories to be told and you couldn't find a better director to do it and do it right and do it real and not cut things out because his family's going to get upset. Or, you know, I think that Richard Linkletter is one of the greatest American film directors that we have. And this sounds awesome. Are you a Bill Hicks or a Linkletter fan? I'm I'm a big stand up fan. I never did stand up myself, but I wrote for other stand ups at Second City. I had a lot of close friends that did stand up and I have been involved in there is no more of a tortured artist than a stand up comedian. So I think you could take any stand up and and you're going to get good content out of it. You know, comedians are very complex and it's just a whole nother world. Stand up comedy is probably the most frightening as far as performing goes feat to actually step up and do. You have to go in a room and tell people that you're funny and then tell jokes. Everybody thinks you're funny at a party. You want to why? Because you didn't walk in and say, hey, I'm really funny, guys. But when you get on that mic, you're telling everybody that you think you're the funniest guy in the world. And they're going to be as hard as possible on you. So Were you a Hicks fan? I'm I'm not going to act like I was a huge Hicks fan, no. Uh, But I I do think he's funny. But I just didn't follow him. Yeah. See, I, I, he was very seminal. I'm a bit older than you. So he was very seminal in the 90s. I think everyone, he was kind of like the new George Carlin. You know, all his stuff was about tripping on mushrooms and the, you know, the overall fallacy of the government and of society and just basically taking a look at not only human consciousness, but the way people react to each other. And I comedians like Bill Hicks to me, Bill Hicks made, he was a little, I, I laughed more at Bill Hicks than I did at George Carlin. I guess it was, I just found more of a Carlin was such a performer. I loved him, but Hicks didn't really crack me up too much. I would often be like, my God, he's so, this guy should run for president. 
Mm-hmm. Like he's just so smart. He was one of those guys. So this is a perfect pairing. Of he's him smart enough fight. not to run. Yeah, I'm a big Norm McDonald fan. And, and he's another one that's very, very insightful, but he never tries to. He actually has a lot of disdain for people like Bill Maher and stuff because he he feels the role of the comedian when you're the comedian is to make people laugh, not be the smartest person in the room. And I think we see a lot of crossover with these days. And no, there's nothing wrong with having a message and being intelligent, but you know, just short story. Uh, when he was on Bill Maher, they have their five topics and he's on the panel with a guy that wrote a book about China. Bill is talking about China and he goes to norm first for his opinion. He goes, ask the guy that wrote a fucking book about China. Not me, you know. Uh, so yeah, but he's very intelligent, very intelligent, and yeah, uh, I like, definitely have respect for Bill Hicks. And I'm sure if I watch one of his stand up, uh, you know, specials, I would laugh my ass off. I, it's, I don't dislike him. I just didn't follow him. Yeah, he, he's 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 very deep, very deep guy. I he like. Has. I don't. We should we should talk about comedians one time because I think we may have similar but differing opinions. I love comedians. But I can't, I guess I maybe I agree with Norm McDonald. I find the current culture of following and listening to comedians as though they are leaders of mm-hmm. social movements and cultural movements to be very not good. So, but let's let's keep it moving. We got a lot to talk about. Um, this is a lot of fun. Three years after Mad Max Fury Road, finally, George Miller is going to direct. It's going to be cool called Years, 3,000 Years of Longing, the follow-up to like the Mad Max series. So far, reports are that Idris Elba and Tilda Swinton have signed on to star in the movie. And I am very ready to see this movie. Now, wait, hold on a second. I think I made the original, this was updated. I think this may be an original story. I don't know I think that it is. this. I think it is. Yeah, he I had plans this is a to do. Okay, because when it was originally, I had read a different report that said it was like a Mad Max sequel, but it's not. It's a. It's its own movie. Okay, that's better. Good. I like him to do something. Now that he did that, man, can you imagine? That guy has had such a career. He did Happy Feet. I mean, he's so diverse. He, he is somebody that even if you don't like Mad Max, you have to respect him. For his yeah. visual storytelling, people think that it's easy to make movies. They think that it's easier to make a movie than a book. I mean, there's arguments for both, but to visually convey your story without the benefit of the POV and the internal dialogue, think about Miller's film, Mad Max. The actors didn't know what the hell was going on when they were filming that thing. Tom Hardy has yeah. an excellent interview about that. He goes, I didn't know what the hell this was. Nobody did, but Miller knew. And that's what a good yeah. director and they had faith in him. And it's amazing. And again, that's not really my thing. I know I say that a lot, but I love that movie because I have so much respect. I'm like, I mean, how many lines of dialogue are even in that movie? And yeah, it, it still tells the story. Propulsion, man. Pure propulsion. It I would. Just, yeah. One of the best of our generation. I love that film. And so I'm really glad. And also, it's kind of cool that, you know, I mean, it's hard to get a movie made these days, no matter who you are, no matter how big a film, no matter how much money it was made. And it's good to see that he kind of took his time and was able to come back with an original. And I like that. It's yeah. an original film. It's something that he's going to write and direct. He didn't jump on to a, you know, the next sequel of another movie, and it's not even a sequel of Mad Max. So that's awesome. Um, all right. Yeah. Moving on is um, this I'm very excited about because I'm a huge Star Trek fan, but I don't know how excited I am because like I said in the past, I've not been the hugest fan of adult animation before. Sometimes it kind of too much goofiness gets me, but this is kind of cool. CBS All Access. Mm-hmm. I guess it's going to be Star Trek All Access now with the Picard show, <laughs> Discovery S, two season order of a Star Trek animated show developed by Rick and Morty writer Mike McCanahan Mm -hmm. called Star Trek Lower Decks, which is actually kind of based on, there was a Next Generation episode where they did this. And they followed like the other crew members, kind of like the tailies and Lost. So I think this is, this sounds like a lot of fun. What is this on? CBS All Access, their streaming service. Oh, in how many seasons did they sign for? Um, two seasons. That's ambitious. Yeah, well, it's animated, so they'll crank them out and they'll do probably maybe six are, to ten episodes. 
right? Are they changing the name of the service? Because I know it, it's not been going so well. I don't know. They should. They should call it Star Trek streaming. I I feel for you, and you know I love you, but I I advise you to heed your enthusiasm. Yeah. <laughs> that I I don't even know how that's still around, man. Nobody's nobody's using that. That's they need to just put shows on CBS. Not everybody can have a streaming service. Yeah. Well, I think that they supposedly the last thing I read is that for the amount of money that they were putting into it, they were making a good amount from it. I don't know how that's true. I don't know who's ordering this. I think I know like one person who pays for CBS all access, maybe two. But it was supposedly doing well enough, but I think that this one will get sucked into it. But I do like Star Trek, so I'm going to give it a shot. When I get in J- January or whatever, I'll get another trial. I'll watch Discovery, and if it's available, I'll check that out. So you so, said you'll get the trial. Yeah, I'll get the trial. I'm See, not- and you're enthused about this. What does this tell you about the future? Like, you're really happy, and you're still not going to buy it. I won't buy it. It's going away, we'll see Sorry, I love you, but it's just, I mean, I, I just see how happy you are. Right now. We're on camera, dude. I'm going to post this. You're too happy for something I can see. It's like you're buying a yacht and you've got two days to live. No, but I see, I disagree because I think the new world is once something gets off the ground and the content is being created, whether or not the service it's on goes away, whatever, there's always an opportunity for it to Amazon again. can pick it up and stuff like that. Yeah. The content is what's king. It's definitely Um, on the ground. It's in the ground. Yeah, baby. There's a saying in business. You can have things good, fast, or cheap. You got to pick two. CBS's dedicated streaming service poses another question. What if you can have none of those things? That's a headline. I don't really care about these services. I get excited about the content. It's not really about the service. Put it on CBS. CBS sucks. Yeah, but it's not. What they're trying to do is use the service. I get that. In order to try to do some different things on it that they think not only is going to attract people, but that they generally wouldn't put on CBS. So I don't think that that if you think about it, Did you watch the first season of Star Trek Discovery? No, I did not. Okay, so it is very serialized and it's a good show, but it no way, shape, or form fits on CBS. There's no way they could put that on CBS. That show would be more suited to AMC, FX. um, Why couldn't it go on CBS? I know it doesn't fit with the rest of their programming, but it has a fan base. That's the way they think. I don't agree with it. I'm not saying I agree with it. But that's the way they think. CBS is a singular brand and they want people to be able to tune in day or night, whatever time, and kind of get what they get. Yes, the Big like Bang that. Theory. Yeah. The right, worst exactly. sitcom, I know, literally. It's terrible. But um, that is an interesting discussion. But these streaming services, I really, I don't really get attached. Like I said, I don't get attached. I get, a, I get excited about, oh, okay, they made this. What it's on is usually, I have the same opinion as you. Like, yeah. I think this, and, and not only does the CBS streaming service have nothing on it, it's terrible. Like, it hardly works. Yeah. Every time a commercial comes, it like buffer, it like stops and reshows you like sometimes two minutes before. Like, it, it's really bad. But I do see what you're saying because these streaming services open up opportunities to more self contained, smaller stories. You know, you get these better. I understand that. It's just, it's sad that we have to launch this kind of a pyramid scheme of a medium to watch it in order to have opportunity open up for a true artist to go and make work that's true to its actual source material. Like we talked about the star Wars and everything else, but yeah, I get it, but it's sad. I mean, I just, I mean, the CBS, their brand is two broke girls and big bang theory, literally the two worst examples of, of television, all jokes aside, they're atrocious. Yeah, no, I agree. I'm not a big fan, brother. Besides that, I really enjoy them. Go ahead. <laughs> all right. Let's, um, Let's jump into just a couple of things are streaming tonight. Uh, and one of them, um, I am excited about Justin, even if it's on Netflix. And uh, that's The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. It's uh, Kieran and Shipka from Mad Men, Mad Men, I should say. And she's playing the Archie comics, you know, the old Sabrina. Greg Berlanti produced it. You know, I love Greg Berlanti. This is now some people from. 
Riverdale are involved with it. I wasn't a huge fan of Riverdale, more so for kind of the setting. So I think I'll like this more, but it's got a kind of fun cast. Miranda Otto, Bronson Pinchot is in it. And uh, they've already renewed it for a second season. And I think my wife and I will get into this. It'll be a lot of fun. Who, I liked, who is this I liked, for, though? So what is the demographic for that show? Um, I think probably from... I don't know. You know, it's kind of in all ages, even those Riverdale, I find that you get teenagers into it, but then also people 20s, 30s, 40s, even gotcha. 50s. Away. I don't I don't do the Riverdale and all that. But yeah, you know. I tried, watched a little of that. I thought it might be fun. My wife and I watched it. But um, were you it, a comic uh, guy? No, I don't care anything about Archie. Com- I mean, I read Archie comics, but I don't give a crap about, you know. I don't even remember. I, I probably read Sabrina comics and stuff when I was a kid. You know, remember Archie? I don't know for you, but they used to be like in the books. They bind them, you know, mm-hmm. almost like the manga. And uh, I used to find those. They'd be like in the dentist office or something. Um, Netflix has another great thing dropping, which this is what I'll probably watch first. It's called Shirkers. Sandy Tan won a documentary directing award at Sundance this year, chronicling the making of what would have been her narrative debut. So this is kind of interesting. A film shot guerrilla style in Singapore in 1992, but the footage was stolen by her American mentor on the film and wasn't uncovered until 20 years later. So it's kind of not only about the making of the film, and it was, I guess, kind of disastrous, but why they couldn't even she couldn't even finish the film. And then I guess she tries to finish it. So the story in itself is fun. It's about filmmaking. I'm down. I read an, I read a couple of reviews and people were, you know, likening it to like American movie. And, uh, uh, I love that type of stuff. Of course, as a filmmaker, I love to watch when people are making movies and I especially like to watch when they show how hard it is. Like you were talking about earlier, how hard it is to make a movie. So I am going to be watching this probably tonight. I don't think my wife's going to watch it, so I'll probably watch it by Can myself. Can you imagine having your footage stolen, though? Uh, yes, because it's happened to me. So it's happened to probably a lot of people who have made movies with other people. I know a lot of stories of it happening, man. It's it's not a, it's not an un, that's one of the things I wonder if they get into that in this. Yeah. It's not uncommon. Film is a collaborative effort. Oh, and it's so, a tough one, yeah. Yep. You always have situations like this. So, Well, the one, the one last thing I wanted to mention, and then we're going to get into our sitcom discussion, is Netflix is premiering the second season of Castlevania, which is an anime that got really good reviews in the first season, and I think I'm going to check it out. And I know you said you're not really into anime, but I've been getting into a little bit more animation lately especially on the more serious side so i think i'm going to check this out castlevania on netflix now there's a bunch of stuff of course coming up this weekend saturday sunday but we are going to move on to a discussion that i'm looking forward to about sitcoms and how they've grown over time so let's do it baby situational comedies the 30 minute sitcom just the light-hearted fun some of them are philosophical, The Good Place. Last five to seven years where escapism was so prevalent. And it's surprising to me that a show like Superstore is surviving and thriving right now. And I love it. And I know we agreed to talk about this with the political climate. When things aren't going great, you see less and less shows like The Office because people just want to escape. They don't want to think about, you know, the grind of real life because that's what The Office is. The Office is literally about a lot of people that are kind of in purgatory if you want to look at it in a dark way and you got a boss that's trying to shine light on it and other people are just trying to get by and it just embodies the american workplace but when when everything gets so so volatile and so poisonous these days you know it's really nice to see especially a a show like superstore has diversity and it has diversity without it being hammered in because it makes sense that you have a diverse crowd of people working in the store and things have changed but also stayed the same because for situational comedy you have your protagonist's wants and needs its wants and needs are directly connected to the obstacle in its way in the first eight minutes you usually will wrap it up in under 22 minutes at the most and then next week it happens again there are shows like always sunny in philadelphia that are anti-sitcoms where 
you don't have any character progression and they made up this. They made a point to try to have no character development. These guys don't learn. I think that it's really interesting to look at how sitcoms have changed since the 90s where we had our more family sitcoms and then in the late 90s you had your friends. You had your move into the city sitcom. The in-betweeners, uh, not married. Seinfeld, yes. Now, Seinfeld is a great example of a show that only thrived because it fell under the radar and there was no network interference. Seinfeld was under a contract, actually, with NBC for the late night programs. It's like a bullpen type system. And so he was being paid. He was on retainer, essentially. He is the type of guy, I guess, that just works. He's not a guy that will just get, you know, the paycheck. He'll go in and work. So him and Larry David started writing. There wasn't a lot of notes, which are notorious in the sitcom world. Notes from network executives that are lawyers, not artists, saying, I wish that bartender would have been more likable. Can't you have a Eddie Murphy type? You know, shit that's not really making sense. But they went under the radar. The first season was a total disaster as far as, you know, ratings went. But they were able to do what they wanted. And they kept only two guys writing that show. Look at the list of writers on modern sitcoms, sometimes 18 writers. I can't see 18 people actually collaborating in a functional manner. But we had this time where you had the family sitcom, then you had the Seinfeld where you're exploring the in-between life of not being in college but not married yet, finding your place in the world. And usually people would go to work in these sitcoms. And sometimes you'd see that if you wanted to see like Al Bundy's buddy at the shoe store. But that wasn't a central plot device. Then the workplace in the early 2000s with the office when we got English office and then we got the American office brought a new angle to the sitcom because it was no longer a place for the characters to leave the couch or their wife and kids. It was a group of people that are existing in the workplace. And I think we both probably know, unfortunately, that it's almost like that ladder in life when you're in high school, then college, that you're like, keep progressing. But then sometimes it's very easy to go and you land yourself a job. And maybe sometimes you're not trying to get that big promotion. Yeah, you wouldn't mind it. But it's like, I hate to use purgatory, I guess static. Is that a fair way to say it? Yeah, I think so. Like I a think plateau. People lit- Uh, also limbo in a sense, you know, and that feeling of also the being in an office or a situation where there is time to be bored, where there, there's like redundancy, like you're saying in Superstore, which is a little bit different from earlier workplace. Like if you go back and see early, even the earliest of workplace comedies, whether it's like WKRP, which is Mm -hmm. kind of a work. Ace Comedy, Mary Tyler Moore, Lou Grant. Um, these were kind of workplace comedies coming out of a lot of films too, right? Yeah. like uh, They would just you, uh, usually be more focused in that time on right. on the character. You yeah, know, exactly. They, y- y- it wasn't you the workplace. You follow them home a lot. Yeah. Exactly. You follow them home a lot. You see what they're doing. Now, I know in The Office, they left The Office more. I didn't watch yeah. the whole run of The Office. But it's about really the where they work. You know, they come back to that place like a cheers. Yeah. You yes. know, they yeah. come back to that place to meet at. It's the place where our characters inhabit. And I think that they yeah. found kind of like a loophole in the system, because what I'm trying to get at is when you have a family sitcom, you have your dynamic of the family, which, you know, hey, every, you know, hack of a screenwriter can write together the, you know, well, a half ass married with children, married children. It's great, by the way. But, you know, you got your dynamic. The daughter doesn't listen to the dad, of course, because she's a teenager. The 13 year old boy is acting up. Of course, these are all struggles and they're primal. We understand them. Even if you're a kid, you understand them. You might root for the different person. The mom is being, you know, worked to death at home and then has to deal with the husband, blah, blah, blah. But what happens with those is they run their course because kids grow up. Kids move on in progression is actually bad for a sitcom if they want to keep it going because the story that they started telling can no longer be told. That plateau, that purgatory, as I say, that limbo of the office opened up an opportunity for a situation and you saw when it did end up finally, you're not failing, but going away and and dropping in ratings is when Steve Carell left. 
but you didn't have situations where people were moving on. So it's not really about an office per se. It definitely plays into it. But you're never worried that much until the last seasons are even concerned with it, whether Jim was trying to get a promotion, right? You're not worried about that. That's not, it's not secession. You're yeah. not, this is not the minutia of business. This is just people trying to get by. They got families, some don't, but they're trying to get by. Michael Scott, you know, is the sunlight in this office, but he's also one of the most flawed characters in the history of sitcom. Ricky Gervais deserves so much credit, but in my opinion, Ricky Gervais made the mistake of playing him as a one-trick pony. He was just utterly goofy and had no redeeming factors. So that works. Like a, yeah, I was, you know, um, I, uh, like I said, I hadn't seen the whole run of The Office, and I, I would, my opinion would be that they're kind of different because you're right. Gervais's character, the way he played it, could not have sustained over how long the American office went. Yes. Um, and when they actually went back and did the movie when he became a folk singer mm-hmm. and traveled around the UK, it was pretty bad. Yeah. You know, it was He's pretty just bad. Being a clown. And yeah, it's not downing. He, take, he was too, he was too, he was too much of a clown, right? And he was completely unlikable. Like there was nothing. To like about him at all you couldn't even revel in the fact of how bad he was because he was like just so cheesy and mm-hmm. you know what i mean and the corel version had a little bit more of a i'm doing this so you like me yes in the things that he did incorrectly and yeah. i mean yeah. let's face it he's a sexist he was a racist but he wasn't those things out of spite or out of he was oh, those, I, I guess you could even, argue ignorance. <laughs> well, yeah, because he, he's not a, like he's not in the clan and he's not beating. But he he says oh, it's a stereotype. It's a lack of mis- It's a lack of understanding. Stuff. Character was developed very well, and I'm not shitting on sorry, crapping on the the Christ. British office. Okay, I know people get very defensive about that. I'm saying that different goals. Okay, yeah, definitely. Because it, and that, that shows what you're saying about the growth of yeah, the sitcom. Just different where, goals. They, yeah, they weren't they, trying to last forever. The NBC's office was. That's when they started to adapt more to long-form storytelling. But yeah. with Steve Carell, he is this kid that, yes, wants to be liked. His actions are not excusable, but we understand where he's coming from, and we see it, and we see him pay the consequences. We see this man that's just trying to bring light to this office, which, ironically, he is goofing off so much and trying to be the coolest boss that he ends up being the best boss because they're just trying to work so they can ignore him. So the productivity is the best out of the whole branch, all the branches. So you have all these archetypes. You got the gym. He's underachieving at every stop in his love life, underachieving in his work, his career. He's smarter. You know, he could be in a higher position, but he just doesn't. He's in that spot that I've been in. I got in that, sadly, when I was waiting tables, which was ridiculous. I was happy. I had an apartment. I, You know what I mean? I was 20. But still, you know, I, I was like, hmm, I don't know. I might not go back to college. Bad decision. But nah, <laughs> you know what I mean? But there's there's some truth to that. But the office made the grind of every day uh, into something so much more, just like Seinfeld did. You know, I mean, you have to create conflict for comedy still. There is no comedy without conflict, just like there's no drama without conflict. They usually just get into their situations because of what makes them funny. And they usually get out of it because of the same reason. You see why people are so eager to try to recreate the office because they embodied, first of all, the reality show aspect. What do they do? They talk to the camera. They sit there and break the fourth wall. Yeah, also. I was looking when when you um, had mentioned kind of concentrating and talking about the office in the notes for this. I went and looked at I've always been I'm a big fan of the mockumentary. Mm-hmm. I love documentary. So I like the mockumentary that's, I, you know, I was fascinated with like Blair Witch and all that kind of stuff. I like that stuff. Um, and I was thinking about other shows that did that and how it became the we the way that the office, like the differences in the way that kind of like the office and parks and rec did it. Yes. Like the office eventually exposed the camera people and they mm-hmm. talked about what was happening and what they were shooting right didn't they become part of the show at one point yeah there was like a relationship with one of them yeah. See, that's interesting and in parks and rec they shot it like that but they never made ref they would look into the camera they would do things like that mm-hmm. but they never really made mention to that and after a while they, they started to do that less and less 
you know, yeah. and it, it became more of like a weird, you didn't, it just, you just accepted it. Well, the, w- the inception of Parks and Rec was just supposed to be the, the office is the private sector there, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, because the, the first season was so different. And they yeah. discovered a lot of the lessons like that you're talking about, we're talking about here about concentrating on characters. It's not the situation and moving away yes. from the situation, moving to the characters you want to be with. Yes. Because that, to me, is also the difference between these kind of single camera sitcoms and the multicam sitcoms. So many of these ex- multicam sitcoms that still exist, I find that the characters, they have their, they, their archetypes, but they're so surface level and they're both surface level and uh, blown up Yes, at the same time that with the laugh tracks and all that, I can't Mm -hmm. get into it. I can't, Seinfeld is about, and if you throw back and go back and watch like a different strokes, facts of life, I can get into the laugh track. But as you were saying earlier, you're not a fan of Big Bang Theory. No, 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 no. Big Bang Theory, honestly, the best blueprint you could ever have for a a bad television show. I'm not. Well, I know, I know other people I have said, I, I, there was um, someone who wrote in uh, one of our, listeners who was a fan and said, give it a shot. You know, you might think that it's funny. Mm-hmm. I had given it a couple of shots and now you've obviously dealt, you've delved into it more than I have. Well, no, no, I've, I've seen an episode and uh, I, I've looked into <laughs> it. it. Listen, the big main theory, th- this is what they embraced. When the office embraced the the, the mundane work life, the, the everyday grind, right? What did they embrace? Because you have to go with the times and that's what I'm talking about with breaking the, you know, going and talking to the cameras. That was topical at the time and now you realize they've stopped and it works because it helps you you're endeared by that you're you're connected yes, to them yep. and that's, that's why you're point. able to get away with so much more because you you see their internal dialogue and this is a way for us to get that you get to see michael scott look into the camera when he's handing out halloween candy to the kids when he's by himself and you can see he's that's sad he's looking point. there it, you know and then when he goes and he says something sexist you're not like yay sexism but you're like okay this guy's just you know, he's a buffoon they're and, like and, and a science in a yes. play Yes. Right? Yeah, Mr. Rogers had that quote in his pocket at all times. You know, uh, if you if you heard everybody's story, there's not a person on this earth you could hate. They get to tell their story. You have the surface level personality and then you have what's within. It's a very clever way to do it. With Big Bang Theory, they base it off nerd culture, right? Pop culture. So that's yeah. a show trying to appeal to pop culture. Guess what they depend on? They depend on situation and references, these geeky little references that guess what the Internet did to the very people that they tried to appeal to, the Redditors, feminist people, bad, bad people. They were incorrect with a lot of their science that they were spitting out. And that's where the comedy was supposed to come from. Sheldon would look at somebody trying to unlock a door and she would be like, I can't unlock it. It'd be like, of course you can't, because then they talk about all these different locks. Not only is that not funny, it'd be funny maybe once or twice, not over 13 years every single time because that's how neurotic he is. You know what I mean? He's this guy that's just totally annoying and that's exactly what he is. But then his references are also, first off, if you aren't informed about locksmithing or all the science and astrology and everything else they talk about in that show, you're, it's going to go over your head. And then if you are informed about it, you're going to realize it's incorrect. doesn't make it. They also have two broke girls. What is that about? What's it named? Two broke girls. Who are they? <laughs> Who are these girls? I They're think two they broke girls, broke. right? They might be broke. And that's it. I think I watched an episode and they were broke. I yep. They were broke. They had a it, wacky you know, character that comes in. It's interesting because I don't, I, I see what you're saying in the sense that now other people may say to us, but no, you know, I love the character of Sheldon or this or that. I find that like what you're saying, the situation overwhelms the characters to me to where I feel like I also, there's a separate, um, there's a separate, in the same way that you were talking about looking at the camera makes you feel closer, having a, having it in a normal workplace, like a, a mundane place, a place of limbo, right? Makes you kind of uh, feel uh, empathetic, yeah. feel as though you've been there before. Mm-hmm. Um, I just find that I have to have, I have to have like a almost secondary or third level of lifting my, uh, 
delusionment with this weird way that they're delivering dialogue and the audience is laughing. It's like a suspension of disbelief that's like doubled or tripled the normal amount that I can't, as I've gotten older, I guess, I can't abide by. Like, I just look at it and it looks like the sequence from, uh, well, man, what's the Woody Har- uh Natural Born Killers. Mm-hmm. When they do the Natural Born Killer sequence with Rodney Dangerfield and Juliette Lewis, and they're pretending that they're, it, it was kind of a spoof a little bit on Married with Children. That's what I feel like every time I watch a CBS comedy. I feel like I'm watching a, like, it's like a surreal version of a comedy. But then when I watch, even if it was a, a The Office, which I, like I said, I haven't seen all of, but I appreciate if it's The Good Place, some of these newer comedies I had added onto that list. I love the playing house. That was all about characters. It was beautiful show. I don't know if you've ever checked that out. But these shows really made you feel and make you feel that you are a part of it. And I can just sync rate single parents is a new one that I really enjoy, which is from the people from Elizabeth Merriweather who did the new girl. I mm-hmm. love new girl, new girl, uh, not the new girl, but new girl. It had its, you know, I mean, it had its problems, yeah. but it was funny because it concentrated on the characters, on their bond, yeah. what they did together, the you know, and made you feel was. like you were part of it. Absolutely. You like know, that, I don't feel like I'm a part of it when I watch Big Bang Theory. Because that's not human beings. Yeah, that's I feel why. like it's yeah, it's like a, a projection that yeah. I'm watching. So the argument you know, from different. somebody that likes that show will say, Axel, well, that's what's so funny is how how inappropriately nerdy they are and how yes. much they're in the pop culture. Guess what? That doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what makes it annoying and then when you it's okay what you want is if you have a character that's always like highly like analytical right he in he's always gonna have that issue and that's gonna be his conflict in life like jerry seinfeld germaphobe or yes. whatever like you yes. know what i mean he finds yeah, conflict in shaking a it's guy's hand something. or something you know what i mean and maybe they didn't get seated at the restaurant and somebody else did that's the conflict and they are such well crafted characters that you can watch that and feel like you're watching an epic tale because it is an epic feat for them because of the (laughs) internal struggle so they can do it anywhere you know the broke girls are so broke the conflict is they're broke and they're never gonna not be broke else it wouldn't be two broke girls i'm I'm sure there's a few episodes where they weren't and that was hilarious you know this is all the same creator right chuck lorry yeah he's he's a terrible terrible uh creator why Uh, is it so popular then why do you think it's so popular? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what that says about people, but people, I don't know. Who people am I, like I guess? different things. There, I, well, I guess it is too. I mean, look, I think we can agree that you and I both enjoy things that are more kind of real, that are speaking yeah. directly to us, that are not obfuscated, right? You have to and, ground it. You yeah, have you have to. That was a little bit going back to Westworld. I think that's a little bit of a problem you may have had with Westworld season two. Mm-hmm. And what I look forward to more, that's why I'm glad that just as a, we never talked about that, uh, they're adding, um, what's his name to Westworld from Breaking Bad. Yeah, I did Aaron. a video on it. Um, oh, okay. Uh, that's Aaron right. Paul. <laughs> Aaron Paul. I, it was right before the hurricane. Oh. I was like, Aaron yeah. Paul's about to be on Westworld. And then my lights went out. So, I love um, it. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm excited for that. Well, it's great because they've adapted it on NBC and they've done it. And, and people sometimes give people grief for uh, replicating and, re, you know, kind of like reverse engineering certain yeah. films and stuff. So, but that's how great films are made. Casablanca has been, you know, reverse engineered everything. That That's what they tell you to do in, in, in these actual workshops is you're supposed to take stories and you're supposed to switch it if it's ride along. You got it. You're supposed to think, okay, who is this? This is a badass cop taking his pansy brother in law for a ride along. Okay, now change that situation. Have the cop be the pansy and the brother in law is an ex Navy SEAL. Right? It's still a good situation because you can't have everything be Seinfeld. And Seinfeld, you know, there's issues with that as well. That's a Seinfeld concept, you know, that flip it. Yeah, that well, was yeah their, exactly. That was their but concept you know, that they talk about. It's not to Latin say you Latin shouldn't have an interesting Latin. dynamic. New Girl has an interesting one with her living there. That's a wacky situation, but they're also... And they let it go. That was the That's the thing that's so interesting about New Girl. And what I see in, the, in Single Parents is just from those two shows, how uh, she learned that 
They tried to force the first season, second season. She's the new girl. She, oh, why is she there? But And then eventually they just realized nobody cares. They just want to see these characters live their life and have fun and be in crazy situations, solve it by the end. But we learn something and then maybe we do a little dance that we do five episodes from now yeah. becomes their signature dance or whatever. And now with single parents is like, they never even like, they didn't even give you the premise like in the first scene, they're like, we're single parents and we meet because we, we're all single. And then they just went on. <laughs> they never even mentioned it. They don't try to get them meet at a club. They, you just get to see them be people. Well, and that's I, why workplace is so yeah. popular. If you had to tell me to spit out a script in, you know, like uh, a month, I'm going to start it with an interview. Want to know why? Somebody's first day at work because everybody has to introduce themselves. Yeah. And it's Every- your first day at work. Yeah. It's you are being brought in. Mm-hmm too yep. so you're joining them this is why you see people sometimes on dates this is why you see them on interviews because yeah. interviews want to know what they ask you who you are why you're there everything you beginning. need to know and you get it's your situation it's yeah. very smart yeah. so you know like the, i have been watching the super story and it has a lot of the same aspects that parks and Rec had in the office i think it's going to go past parks and rec as far as funny. And I got really like- to get into it. I watched the first three episodes. I enjoyed it. I love the two stars. Yeah. I yes. love that dude. He was on um, Mad was Men in Silicon Valley. Yes. Yeah. And it, there was a, uh, there was a movie that he was in. Oh, remember, Oh, you know, remember he was also, yeah, Silicon Valley. And there was a movie I saw him in that was more dramatic that I really liked him. And America Ferrara. Yep. is on that too. Right. Yes. And I thought it was good, but I got to get back to it. That's one that I could, I can like stream and like put together my Gundam and watch it and everything. I love, now are you up to date on the good place? No, I'm way behind. And okay. I hope to get there I'm after not. this uh, eventually, yeah, but, um, I, I, I saved, I streamed the whole end of the first season and the second season a couple of weeks ago. And I started taping this, I guess this third season. And I watched the first episode or two, and then I was like, you know what? This is better, actually, when you binge it. So I'm saving them up, and I have like four of them in my DVR. Well, the project that I'm working on, and and I know we won't want to go on too late, is uh, it it does include that because I do include how to introduce your characters and how it's, you know, there's this saying, oh, all all sitcoms are the same, you know, and to a point, yes, that's true. You know what I mean? There's a lot of similarities. It, it is situation comedy and it has to uh, adhere to a structure. But what I'm doing is is showing you who the Toby is. I'm showing you who the Michael is. I'm looking at the archetype, showing you when they combine characters and why it works. But I can also show you who those characters were before Michael Scott. They weren't as good, but they've been there. But with The Good Place, a great example is what does she do when she sits down with Ted Danson right away? She goes, who are you? Where am I? And why am I here? Yeah. Perfect. But I, I'm going to make a prediction on this. I'm halfway through the first season. I hope it's not true because I, I really love and I know we can probably tie it up after this. You know, I want to talk about South Park a little bit. I like turning my brain off, but the philosophical questions that the good place poses. Oh, dude, if you're great, seen- but I still fear it's going to fall flat. No, I see some no, issues. No, I hope it doesn't. Me, I hope it brother. doesn't. Trust me. Not only does it not fall flat, it goes I don't want to say it down the rabbit hole because that sounds cra- like a crazy no. It, they have a plan and it is great and it proceeds wonderfully and you will love it. Seasons is ahead. What? Good Place. The Good Place? Oh, only two. Only two. It's on its third season. Oh, I thought somebody, I thought it was listening. I was like, how much of this did I miss? Okay. Yeah. I've only no. watched the first half, but yeah, I really enjoy yeah, it. I love Kristen Bell, but yeah, it's great. You know, it poses questions that we all think about and like we I agreed to talk about a little bit because it's it's risky situation with our political climate and how it changes. You know, that's Game of Thrones hit its peak because people were yearning for escapism. People didn't want to even think about being in an office. People just wanted to get the hell out of our world, you know, and yeah. you see this. So uh, a show like The Good Place brings up a lot of great questions and gives us a little bit of escapism and can have a commentary on everyday life. Now, what do you think about like, have you seen what the new episodes of South Park are doing tackling school shootings? They are addressing that. How do you feel about that? Do you think that's appropriate? Um, I mean, I, I I'm I'm for everyone exploring everything always because it's art and i love it but i'm just not a fan of south park yeah i i i i I mean you know i was into it when it first came out the guys were funny 
But as it's progressed, I find them to be a little too nihilistic mm -hmm. and I don't really, it's, it's like that animation too. I don't like, rah, 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 yeah. rah. like, I don't like that. I like, if it's going to be animation, just kind of be normal. I don't need all this like fast paced, crazy Simpson shit. And I, so for me, I do appreciate it and it, it's groundbreaking. And actually the documentary that shows how they make South Park with them and Bill Hader is amazing. How they not and fail. They are so crazy creative and what they do. It's just not my bag. I appreciate its place yeah. in history and what it does, but it's just not something that I've ever in, really enjoyed that much. I always found it kind of annoying and I never found it very funny at all. I, I don't think, think I fell off. I probably were about the same. I fell off for about almost 10 years. I mean, I think I stopped watching it in high school and the last few seasons were not good because I don't like low hanging fruit. And let's face it, I can't even watch late night TV. Now Trump is the lowest hanging fruit there is. And it doesn't do, you know, people that have beliefs yeah. like us any justice just to have the comedian shitting on the other side all the time. You got to find common ground, True. low True. hanging fruit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, do you something. Gotta, better. Explore it. I, yes. I agree. I agree. In South Park, I came back last season, didn't like it. And then I heard the buzz about this school shooting episode. I'm like, I got to see this. And I got to say, because it disturbs me. I don't have a child, but I have a niece. So, yeah. you know, and I would care about kids anyways, people, even if I didn't have a niece, just not as much. But uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, I was like, holy crap, what are they doing? And it's brutal. It's brutal. But it's I think it really works the way they handled it. And I think if you are able to 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 really satirize something like that and and have people actually learn from it and kind of put it where I think it needs to be. Because I think the issue with these school shootings lately are the news makes money off broadcasting them and they literally rank these school shooters. Yeah. That's if you shoot up yeah. a school, you're looking for to be noticed and the news gives you that. So the best thing yeah. that can happen is they can just do what I think South Park is doing, doing a narrative and how people are burnt out and how there's people you can only freak out for so long and then you just get desensitized and then you move on to the next thing. They did a it's perfect a, episode. A, they yeah. had the school shooting, the second episode. They started with another school shooting, then they pan over to the church, literally, because they're yeah. addressing the molestation issues, which is sad because right. how many times they had to do yeah. that. So it's I, just, I thought that was very beautifully artfully done. In, in very yeah, smart. I don't. I mean, I look. I agree with you. These are subjects that are incredibly important to all of us, and I think that I. I, I guess my opinion is while I'm listening, I'm just like, I wish it was just somebody different than South Park that was. I hear you. <laughs> you know, like I. But I like. But I have to give them credit yeah. for taking the sitcom format, making it a this adult animation, and making it insane the way they produce it and they are so character based while staying inside the situation as well it's it's a, it's it's its own thing you know like when you were talking about also when i was looking into other sitcoms it makes me think of things like larry sanders yeah it's it's its own thing you know there's certain things that are milestones like i definitely think the office is mm -hmm. friends seinfeld you know the office i think new girl will be seen as kind of a neo version of letting it go and being with the characters. Um, but something like South Park, something like Larry Sanders, something like uh, Louie, something like uh, are just kind of their own creations to me. And I think South Park kind of exists outside the spectrum of that, of what would be considered in the discussion of like, sitcom it's but it's it, it, it's within it but it's almost like its own thing you know it definitely is and and i am i think we're right on the like same page with it i had, i would yeah. really hope you'd watch these episodes because maybe it's just me but i'm really impressed because i thought oh they're just going for shock this is going to be disgraceful i can't explain it properly how they handled the shooting situation because it's a very serious topic but i thought i, they, find, no, I, but thought, I, find it. I, oh, I thought they did it so well and that's something that's yeah. so you have to just give them credit because they pulled that's it what off. I'm finding it uh, surprising by because yeah. when you said to me, I want to talk about South Park and then you start and maybe it even showed on my face here in the video and you're talking about this school. Show, I was kind of like, oh, God, I don't know. But the, maybe I should check it out because the thing about those guys is every once in a while they hit it. That's yeah. how I kind of feel about them. Like it's like people on Twitter who say crazy shit just to get noticed, get attention, mm -hmm. do whatever, or just because that's who they are. 
every once in a while you hit upon something. You do have like a George Carlin moment, a Bill Hicks moment where you're like, whoa, where the hypocrisy or the the way our society deals with something can be mirrored in such a way through this television show. But I'll, I'll check that out, man. I'll yeah, check it out. Yeah, but I do know, have to kind of wrap it up. Go ahead. You do yeah, kind go of ahead. Have yeah. to get going, man. Did you want to, I want, I want to let you uh, wrap it up though. If you had anything more you want to say about the sitcoms. Yeah. I mean, uh, keep an eye out for my video. I'm just showing how they've combined these archetypes and why these are universal and they've always been a part of storytelling. So I find them to be very interesting, especially if you're stressed out, you know, and you have anxiety or something, it's fun to watch just good lighthearted yeah. shows, you know, just as much as it's fun to talk about ph philosophical shows and all that. Sometimes you just got to turn the brain off. So yeah, thank that's you so why, much for dude, having me. Justin, I, I, I hate to interrupt. I'm sorry, brother, but that's why And here I'm like, let's wrap it up, but I got to talk more. That's why we do what we do. Uh, <laughs> but, um, I was feeling down. The kid had gone, was going to kindergarten. I kind of missed him. You know what I'm not kind. I did. I missed my boy. You know, things were changing and actually really watching the good place, even though it has deep stuff, it's so funny and the characters are so heartwarming. It's so great that it made me feel so much better. And just like you're saying, the, the cheers, the ultimate, a place where everybody knows your name. That's how, that's the kind of sitcom that I want. The characters that I want to live in is the characters. I don't care where the place is. It doesn't need to keep sticking to that. Like that formula, like the nerdy people. I don't care. They can change. They, I just like the people who things are written well and they're written for the characters to connect with real people. You know, and I think that's what you're talking about. I'm, I'm yeah. interested to see your videos. I like having discussions like this, even if we go back and forth on things or jump around. Well, yeah, this we don't. Fun, man. We don't want to kiss like each other's ass, you know. I mean, <laughs> you know, like I, I do podcasts where I just I, I act like there's somebody else there, and I'm like, "You're right, Justin. Good point. You're so smart. You should have more subscribers." No, but yeah, it is what it is. You know, you want flawed characters, but you want flawed characters that you understand their flaws and you yeah. don't have to accept their flaws. You just have to still be able to enjoy what you're watching because yeah. it's been fleshed out. Not this guy is a dick because he's a dick, but check out this pop culture reference. What's this character about? He likes to make pop culture references. That's not a human being. There's a love interest too. How is he going to handle that? Not like a human being. All right. See you later, CBS. But I guess they don't want yeah. Star Trek on their series. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> thanks for having me on. And hopefully that video will turn out, uh, you know, to be something I'm proud of. So much for having me on. We will um, see you guys soon. Thank you, Axel.